Shabbat Shalom, everyone. And Shabbat Shalom, everyone who's watching online. Join me as you recite the blessing before reading today's Torah portion in the book of Shemot chapter 1, Exodus chapter 1. Baruch et Adonai Amevorach Baruch Adonai Amevorach Leolam Vaed Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Bekar Banu Mikol HaAmim Venetan Lano Etorato Baruch Atah Adonai no ten Torah. Bless Adonai, the Blessed One. Blessed is Adonai, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the Universe, who chose us from among all the peoples and gave us His Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai, Giver of the Torah. Amen and amen. Today's portion again comes from the book of Shemot, Exodus chapter 1. Is it okay? Give me one second to change my battery. Actually, I'm okay here. I'm good. All right. Join me as we... There we go. Join me as you read together or as you hear at home the first few verses of the book of Shemot, Exodus chapter 1. It says, Ve'ele Shemot b'nei Yisrael chabayim mitzrayma et... Yaakov, Ish, Uveto, Bao, Reuven, Shimon, Levi, Vi Yehuda, Yisachar, Zebulun, U, Vinyamin, Dan, Ve Naphtali, God, Ve, God, Ve Asher. Now these are the names of the children of Israel, which came into Egypt. Every man in his household came with Jacob, Reuben, Shimon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied, and waxed exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Pharaoh oppresses Israel. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pitom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar and in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. And the king of Egypt spake unto the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shifram, and the name of the other Puah. 
And he said, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And now the blessing after reading the Torah portion. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher netan lanu Torah emet Vechaye olam netabetohenu Baruch atah Adonai Noten haTorah Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and planted within us everlasting life. Blessed are you, Adonai, giver of the Torah. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Today's Torah portion, we start the book of Exodus, which in Hebrew is Shemot. The complete portion is Exodus 1, 1 through 6, 1. Let me give you an overview of this. There's a lot of uh, wonderful things in here that we've covered over the last few years, but today I want to talk about uh, at least one or two things that we haven't talked about before as a community. Uh, the children of Israel, they went down to Egypt, they multiplied, and because of this, Pharaoh enslaves them and orders the Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua, to kill all the male babies at birth. When they don't comply, he commands his people to cast the Hebrew babies into the river Nile. A child is born to uh, Yocheved, the daughter of Levi, and her husband Amram, and placed in a basket on the river while the baby's sister, Miriam, sound, uh, stands watch from afar. Uh, the daughter of Pharaoh discovers this boy in the basket. She raises him as her son and names him Moses. As a young man, Moses leaves the place and discovers the hardship of his brethren. He sees his brethren as slaves. He sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. He gets angry and he kills this Egyptian. The next day, he sees two Jews fighting. When he admonishes them, they reveal his deed from the previous day. They tell on him that he had killed this uh, Egyptian. And because of this, Moses is forced to flee to Midian. Then he rescues Jethro's daughters. He marries one of them, Sipporah, and becomes a shepherd of his father-in-law's flock. God appears to him in the form of a burning bush. And the reason I say uh, in the form of, which we're not going to get into today because I don't have time to, but he appears to him in the form of a burning bush as opposed to in a burning bush at the foot of Mount Sinai and instructs him to go to Pharaoh and say those famous words to Pharaoh, let my people go. Later on, Moses' brother Aaron is appointed to serve as his spokesman. In Egypt, Moses and Aaron, they assemble the elders of Israel. And they tell them that the time of their redemption has come. The people believe, but Pharaoh refuses to let them go. And he even puts his thumb more on the children of Israel. Moshe returns to God and he asks him, why have you done evil to this people? And God promises that redemption is close at hand. You know, just before freedom comes, just before a baby is born, it's the worst time of the labor process, right? And we hear that idea, you hear it's always darkest when? Just before the dawn, right? You would think, what about at midnight? But the idea is just before the dawn. Um, what's that? You've got a long way to go. You got long, right, right. If you think it's dark at midnight, you've got a long way to go, for sure. This idea, um, we talked about a lot the last few years about Mount Sinai and the, um, uh, the plannings of the exodus out of Egypt and but I want to continue with where we left off these last few weeks with Joseph and the children of Israel with this idea of um, Israel of God 
commanding and making a way for the children of Israel not to make an aliyah into the land, but to actually descend and go to, Israel, or go to Egypt for 400 years. There's a lot of talk about um, Israel, look how bad they are, they don't obey God's law, so because of that, blah, blah, blah. But it's very clear within Judaism, and right there in Scripture you see that it was God who, even Joseph says, hey, brothers, don't forget about it, don't be um, troubled by what you did to me, because it was God who brought me down here. Amen. And we talked about this idea earlier in class about trying to help people, um, but at the same time recognizing that sometimes people are in situations and circumstances out of their own doing and or because God has placed them there, so if you're helping them too much, then in effect you're coming against the plan of God to deliver them from that particular Egypt And it may not be their time to rise up to the level of going into the land. Mm -hmm. And it's tough. And I wasn't planning on talking about this, but this comes up a lot within Christianity. I remember days within Christianity where there were um, those who, um, uh, in ministry, who were evangelists. And they had this desire to see, you know, people saved and the whole thing. And they were constantly, well, we had a family member who was very... uh, evangelistic in ministry direction and but they're all he was always so gung-ho that what he did was he caused more problems than good because he didn't recognize the fact that the day you plant the seed and the day you water it wasn't the same day that you harvest the fruit that there was a lot of time in between and it was important to recognize you need to leave that alone You've already planted. Now, what did Yeshua say? He said, some planted, some watered. But who's the one who comes back and... But it's who, who's the one who gives the increase? But it's God that gives the increase, right? So can you, you can imagine that if you're not careful, you can just uproot, if it, well, unseed the seed that you've planted. Or you can overwater it and just drown the thing. Not allowing it the time and the circumstances, everything that comes into play with God being the one who causes that seed to grow and come up, right? Mm -hmm. And we see this within Judaism. It's just very much understood that it it doesn't matter what the farmer does, Mm -hmm. what does, it doesn't entirely depend on the farmer what he does. It's God who ultimately is the one who decides to, for a produce to to come up. Um, It's not just anybody or anything. That makes sense? So I want to talk to you today about this very, very beginning of this Shabbat Shalom. The very word we start with here in the Torah portion today, it says, Ve'ele shemot b'nei Yisrael chabayim mitzrayma. The very first word we get to, I want to talk about. So we all know that it, when you see a V in Torah, Shabbat Shalom, we see, what does that mean what do you, when we see this vav? What does the vav indicate when it's at the beginning of a word? And, right? So that's why when we do the vea hafta, we don't start off vea hafta at Adonai. We start off, or when we do it in English, we say, well, Hebrew, ve a hafta. And we say, and for ve, you shall love, Right? So when you see that word, it means and. And it always means that it's connected to what was said prior to it, right? Mm-hmm. If you see but, what does but mean? It's separate from what was just said. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in English, we have words like therefore or because of what was said. But you see in Hebrew, ve all the time. And in this particular one, we're going from the end of Joseph to the beginning of Shemot, beginning of Exodus, and it says, ve'ele shemot. And, exactly. And these are the names of the children of Israel. So what's the significance about this? Rashi points out something interesting. He says, although scripture is already counted 
the children of Israel by name while they were alive. When they went down into Egypt, Genesis 46, 8 through 27, it again counts them when it tells us of their, their death, of when they died. Remember the 70 who came in? It talks about these 70. It talks about them again when they die. Thus showing how dear they were to God, that he counted them twice, basically. He talked about them twice. And they were compared to the stars, which also God brings out and brings in by number and name when they cease to shine, as it is said in Isaiah 4, 26. <clears throat> he bringeth out their host by number and calleth them all by name. So what does all this mean? It's interesting that his kuni says, Joseph had witnessed the fulfillment of Hashem's words to Abraham, that his descendants, those 70 and further, would multiply like the stars while in a land not their own. Genesis 15, 5, 3. Rabbi Abahu says in Shemot Rabbah 1, 2, it's interesting what he says here. Anywhere that Ele, the word, word Ele is started, it negates what came before it. However, when you have Ve Ele, it adds praise to what preceded it. So these Ve Ele, the names, it's adding praise to the 70 people cited above or cited in that verse. And it's saying, in effect, that they all were so righteous that they should be talked about again. It's interesting how you can start off with 70 and end up with a great, this great, humongous nation. It's interesting you can start off with one, with Jacob, and end up with this great... It's interesting you go all the way back. We talked about Abraham earlier who it wasn't, didn't have a written Torah to read from. He didn't have a, a synagogue to go to. There was no temple. There was no such thing as a Jew. There was no such thing as a anything. Everything was oral at that point. And he, for lack of a better term, heard from God and decided to pick up from Los Angeles and move to New York thousands of years ago when he barely had wheels and wagons. Think about that. That's the parallel today, you know. With no cell phone, no pay phone, no emergency phone on the side of the highway, nothing. No roadside service. service. (laughs) You know, yesterday our internet at some point went out and I was trying to hit print to print the last few things and I had no internet. And our internet, our printer is connected via internet to our computer. So that's why I have my computer today because half of the stuff didn't print. And I tried to plug in the printer to the computer, but it just it needs a bunch of... It's like, ah. Uh, just that one little thing kind of just knocked my Shabbat off a little bit, bit. So here it is. You have all this stuff going on from one person. Then we pass through Noah. Then you come up to Jacob and all of his children, and you come up to Joseph, and now he's the um, Zafnat Paneah, the second in command over Egypt. And he, God says, take those 70 souls that you've created or those souls that you have, you have caused to follow you to serve the one true God and go down to Egypt. Not up to the promised land, go down to Egypt. See, this is what we talk about, about the uh, many in the body now. If it's not about everything going great unless going up and ascending to, you know, in the ways of God and getting more and have, then they don't want anything to do with it, especially in America. That's not the ways of God. That's the ways of man that has taken it um, and run with it. Anybody have any thoughts about that? Oh, go ahead, Case. Go ahead. I want to. There is, um, and I'm not really prepared to discuss that, but let's take a look at it. I don't have the, let's see, do I have the, yeah, 
there is, and I, I, yeah, I don't want to answer it right now because I need to check on something. But so to even answer your question in a better way, there's always a reason why something is in a certain order and, um, or not, right? This idea, I want to point out one other thing in here. It says in the first... In the first line, it says, Ve'ele Shemot B'nei Israel Chabayim. And it doesn't say Mitzrayim. It, said, it says Mitzrayim in Hebrew. In English, it's just going to say Egypt. So what's the difference between Mitzrayim and Mitzrayim? So this is the kind of stuff that comes up in Hebrew that doesn't come up in English. And we're just going to take a moment on this. Bear with me one second here while I find what I want to see here. If I'm on the same page, it seems like the seven went down to Egypt. Mm -hmm. Strictly for survival reasons. Right. Well, I mean, in, in, that's what I was saying. In, I know in, there's always more to it than that. Yeah. <laughs> Hang on a second, let me see if this printed out what I wanted to talk to you about here. There's always those natural reasons. But the question, I asked you this question now on top of that, then why do they have to stay down there for 400 years? Did the, the, uh, did the drought last for that long? No, no. So that brings you to the question, then why? Um, Oh, here we go. Say that again. What'd you say? What did I say? <laughs> oh, why? Right, right. So this is the question you have to ask. Why did God, if it was just a natural thing that was in their hands, either to go down or not go down there, or even to leave at any time, right? Which it, we uh, clearly see that it wasn't. And one thing we talked about um, a year or two ago was this idea of there was a new pharaoh and he didn't know and we've talked about some different things about that but I want to um, read something to you here that is pretty uh, connected to a lot of what we've talked about with um, just the days that we live when we just read through this idea of Moses sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, and he killed him. So he had a reason to do it. And then the next day, he sees two Jews fighting. Here we go again with what we see in going on. We always find ourselves in Torah. We see in Israel what's going on, where Moses, representing the children of Israel, there's Egyptians or there are um, foreigners who are being killed. Why? Not for, no, not for just any kind of reason, No. Because they were found beating or killing Jews. That's understandable. And also what we see there, sadly, is at the same time, we're seeing Jews fighting each other. This is the sad part we keep running into. That's the part that we pray that comes to an end. Amen? But listen to this here. Um, I don't want to get too deep into some of this, but I want to give you a good surface level of this. When we see this, when it says Mitzrayim, um, it means one thing when it says Mitzrayim, ah, it demonstrates, this is what the rabbis had to say, that the Shekinah, the Shekinah, descended into Egypt with the sons of Yaakov. So not only did they descend, but also the glory of God, the Kavod, his presence descended and was with them there. Think about that, and we're going to see this later on when we talk in a few weeks when, um, when, no, uh, when um, Moses, when he goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. We're going to see this happen, and we'll talk about this more. But there's this idea, I've heard people teach, oh, well, they misquote one of the prophets, and they say that the, um, that the, the presence of God left the Wailing Wall left the Holy of Holies, and that's not what it says. 
it says it was it's diminished. So we've talked about this idea of like this sliding scale, you know. You can imagine like a battery. Yeah, I just changed my battery because the ones I had were, it was low. It was still there. It worked, but there was less power in it, right? The same kind of thing would happen with the Shekinah. It went, it was lessened. Not that it's totally gone, but it's lessened. On the other side of that, and I don't want to get too far down this road, there's only a little bit of God that we actually know about and can see that's been revealed even to uh, the children of Israel. There's this idea in Hebrew, it's called um, simsum, and it's kind of like I picture like the sun. You know, we see a little bit of the sun, right? But the sun has to stay far enough from us where it doesn't burn us if it gets too close. And if it's too far away, then we freeze. But it's staying at a perfect spot because we can't handle all, all of it. All we can handle is this little bit of it that allows us to. So it is with the presence of God and God. That all we can handle is this little bit that we get until uh, later on we'll be able to see he'll manifest more. But th- think about that, right? So this idea right here, of the presence of God going with them into Egypt. This is before the building of the temple, the tabernacle in the wilderness. This is before building, building the holy ark. He was with them. See, this is why when people try to tell you things and they want these definite, that's it, answers, say, wait a minute, there's more, a whole lot more to it than that, and you're denying how powerful God is. Oh, we know all about it, and that's it. We don't have to, you know. We studied this last year. We don't have to study it again, this whole idea. Um, the sages of Israel get the idea that the Shekinah was, being in, was basically in exile as well with Israel. We also see the uh, Mitzrayim spelled with the letter H twice in Genesis uh, 46, 7, and 8. This is more emphasis that the Shekinah was going down, descending to Egypt with Jacob and his sons as they went. That's amazing, yeah. Is it like similar to the name of God being added to another person's name? With the extra similar, similar, yeah. And before we close the Torah, I'll show you guys, and it, it's right there, right up front. We can see it. But this idea, this notion that exists within a lot of the body that, oh, Israel, the Jewish people, they're not God's chosen people. They've been replaced by the Christians. You better watch who you're saying that. You're like the bride. You're like a mistress who comes up during the wedding and tries to jump in front of the bride to marry the groom on, you know, for everyone to see. And you think it's okay. It's not okay, guys. It's not. You know, I'm glad that we know this and we're able to... But I just want everyone here to be strong in that understanding because you'll be bombarded with stuff with people put, you know. And they're not even careful about saying it. They just say it and just... But if you say one little thing, then, oh, that's not, you know. Yeah, go ahead. Exactly. Right. God has divorced his first wife, married a second one. And if you're not careful, yeah, you could end up being divorced too. And a third one can be. No, he didn't break his ketubah. He didn't. See, this is when, when God comes and he gives this. He gives the Torah, the agreement, the marriage contract to Israel. That's it. He didn't break it. He'll never break it. Will they break it? Maybe. But that's a whole other thing. He won't break it. God's not a breaker of promises to anybody. And it's like the human mind wants to automatically go um, and try to find someone to blame and has more uh, seemingly at times more faith in finding someone to blame than it does in finding, you know, blaming God for his faithfulness. You know, blame God that he will never Leave Israel. Blame God that he doesn't lie. How about that? You want to point, point at God and show how faithful he is and not how man 
And then this idea of pointing out how man is unfaithful, but me, you know, I'm okay. I'm not like them. They're evil. And they're, when you've got the same wicked stuff you're in your heart, maybe it's not manifesting the same way, but you're doing the same kind of thing. Uh, that's even worse. Amen? There's another interesting thing to note. Um, and by the way, uh, in case she's watching, Mora uh, Devora Kalik, she gave me a lot of, she gave me her notes, which has a lot of interesting stuff that I'm pulling from this week that she taught in class. She's on Facebook. If you guys ever want to watch during the week, some really good. Do you know who she is? Okay. Let me know if you're interested. She's one of the teachers in the yeshiva. Matter of fact, she'll be here with us in March. Haven't announced that yet, but she's wonderful. That be, She's coming with her husband. That being said, in, in verse 1, it says, the verb habayim, speaking of the children of Israel who came to Egypt, the verb is in the present tense. But it's interesting because hadn't they already come to Egypt back in, in Genesis 46, 8? They're already there, right? So it's already happened. Why does it seem that the children of Israel are just coming now into Egypt? They weren't. Hazal, the sages, asked the same question in Midrash Tanhuma. And, but here's what it teaches. Here's the significance of it. It teaches that a new era began with the passing of Yosef, whose death is mentioned in the last verse of uh, Genesis Bereshit 50, 26. The letter of Av and Shemot 1 not only connects us to the um, previous portions that are mentioned, but it helps to understand that since the enslavement only began after Joseph's death, it is, also, it is as if the sons of Israel are only now coming to Egypt. They've been there physically for a while. Joseph dies, and that's when this whole exile kind of starts in earnest or in a different way in the spiritual sense, for lack of a better word. Something else happens. And you know how it is when someone in the family dies. A patriarch, you know, and the family dies and nothing is quite the same and there, something begins to shift and begin to change. But now you can imagine when all 70 of these are gone and they're in exile. But God keeps his promise and the Ruach, the Spirit of God, the Shekinah of God is still there with him. But listen to this here. Yeah. Okay. So after Joseph dies is when this uh, exile is really taking hold. It is as if the sons of Israel are only now just coming to Egypt on that very day. As long as Joseph was alive, the children of Israel were treated with respect. Once he was gone, the attitude of the Egyptians changed. And now the children of Israel will experience the true nature and corruption of Egypt. All because Hashem led them down there. See, this, what this isn't, this isn't an idea like with Lot and Abraham when their, uh, their herdsmen were fighting and they, Lot said, oh, I'll just go over here, I'll end up, you know, you take this side, I'll take that side. He ends up in Sodom and Amorah. He chose that. He chose to go there. He didn't need to. He chose to. This is God sending the whole nation down there to basically a nation in its infancy, if you will, to be amongst the corrupt. When you hear Egypt, Egypt represents the lowest of every sin. It's like the low point. And that's where he sends his people to grow up and to... These people who talk about the rapture, they don't realize that every story you see, the righteous suffer alongside or they go through the same things that the, the wicked do. But God makes a way for them. But they're not taken away and are allowed to just look and see everything. That no. God says, uh, we see in Sodom and Gomorrah, he says, get out. But he tells them, he, okay, you're, there's only a handful of them. There wasn't a whole... Um, Noah's Ark, did Noah and his children and wife, did they get like taken, you know, by rocket ship to the moon to watch to see what was going on? No, they were there. They were in the rock and the boat was rocking. They were there and they hurt. They had to hear everybody dying. 
all of this stuff, this whole idea that a lot of the body is on is into, we just have to do a, uh, present them with the truth and let people decide. Amen? So all of that being said, um, anybody have any questions or thoughts? We're going to end it right there. I think we've hit on this enough for the day. Um, We have, since you guys are just here, I would, had a little show and tell today. I'll show this to you. You want to take this back here to him, Harrison? Later on in the portion is, the, is Mount Sinai where Moses is up with the burning bush. So this is a rock that was collected from the top of Mount Sinai. And all of these rocks up there, when you break them, they have, a, they have like a bush inside them or branches inside, uh, which is incredible, so... Uh, we showed that earlier, especially the bottom section. The one side, you can see more of it in there. All right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it was when he led, he led them in, it was, it was what would be, well, yeah, it was the Jewish people, it was the children of Israel, right? When he led them out, he still led out the children of Israel, but a mixed multitude of people, they, in effect, they grabbed the zitzi of a Jew and said, we're going with you because you know God is with you, is what they did, and they left with them. So and this is where, um, it gets kind of tricky because within Christianity, there's this more of a mentality that God led everyone, you know, and God died for everyone. Whereas within Judaism, Messianic Judaism, He died for Israel, and because He did that, then everyone who else who wants to cling, graft themselves onto Israel, can take part of that, right? And so this is the kind of stuff that's real important when we say it to say it like that because it means a whole different thing. Um, I'm sure if you guys would have said that at the breakfast, something like that, then they, the guys would have been like, wait a minute. They said, no, that's us. We're the ones who God did. You know, and He sent Jesus for one. If it was only just one person who needed to be saved, he would have sent Jesus. That kind of mentality. But that's not what Scripture says. He's the Redeemer of Israel, a whole nation. And because he did that, that caused them to, enough of them, some of them to repent, not all of them did, but it opened up a door for everyone else to kind of come in to be part of Israel. Yeah, go ahead, Case. That means it's talking about the Shekinah, his glory, yeah. His kavod, yeah. No, there's a few times I mentioned a few verses earlier that has that as well. Um, oh, see, yeah. So, so there you go. So you see, and again... If you see it in English, it's just going to say Egypt every time. It has no indication that's 28 times you're, you, you're saying that shows up in here. The last thing I want to talk about is verse 5. In verse 5, it says, And all the persons who emerged from Jacob's loins were 70 souls, and Joseph was in Egypt. And in Hebrew, what it says is, And all the, and all the person who emerged from Jacob's loins were 70, soul. So in English, we see this as individuals, 70 people, but in Hebrew, it doesn't say that. It's basically saying there were one. They were like there were one soul and there were one people that emerged from him, which doesn't come up at all in English. Uh, it's, it says nephesh, not uh, nephesh the plural. So, go ahead, yeah. So then that would account for the difference between the group on the truck where it says there were 75 or 78 souls that came out of Egypt because that was not oh. what emerged from it. No, see, and so when you're... Some time back, someone brought that up to me, but they brought it up with this idea that it was some type of contradiction in Scripture, but it's not. Because if you, and I don't know this for sure, I haven't checked it out, but if you go to like the Peshitta, the Aramaic version of the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, you're going to, there's a reason for it. It says that. You even see right before that, at the end of Genesis, it says um, 66. 
And then a few verses later, it says 70. Why is that? And we went through that whole rigmarole too, what it, the significance of that is too. Um, but yeah, 70. Um, yeah. It didn't include, no, they were already there. Um, or it says, did it say 66 or 74? I get it mixed up. It was either four more or four less. I think it was four less. I don't have it in front of me, but the idea is there's a reason. We, I think we may, have, we may not have talked about that. But this idea I'm trying to get you to see is that Israel is like it's one soul. It's one. So when you have a Redeemer comes from one, it, you can see that different than a group. But you can see how everything that Israel does is as one. And, wow, I could keep on going, but I'm not. Anybody have any thought about this? No. no. Yeah, yeah. Because they're unified, they're one. And sometimes they're not. But they were unified, why? Was it some miraculous thing that God just brought them all together and caused them all to think the same way and caused them all to do the same thing? No. See, they had to decide. They had to decide to do this. See, this is why we see going on in Israel now with, when there's no unity. This brought this whole situation on and it'll continue. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. Don't expect it to end anytime soon. I mean, really look for some worse things to happen. As you see the, their leadership continue just to fight, 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 fight one another. Um, uh, not really. Somewhat. 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 Yeah. Um, we're going to leave it right there. Father, we thank you and praise you for this time we've had together. We thank you for your great love and peace, Lord, and your, your mercy that you've given, Lord, that has uh, just made a way for us to continue to learn, oh God. It's all by your mercy and by your grace. We thank you for everything you're doing, everything you are. In Yeshua's name, amen, amen. All right. Yeah.